Good afternoon. Wow, what a great turnout. I, uh, I really want to thank all the students, faculty, and staff that have uh, shown up today, and also our uh, distinguished panel that we have. I think there's going to be some really interesting stuff that we're going to be able to go over and uh, uh, get involved with. The, the purpose of this panel is to look at the impact of health care reform. And I know a lot of you are very familiar with this, either uh, through your courses, uh, the things that you're involved in through research, or in the courses that you teach. Um, this is the most significant legislation that's been passed since the 60s, when the, when the uh, Johnson administration passed Medicaid and Medicare. It has tremendous implications for what we all do as instructors at a university and what you all will be doing as practitioners. Um, so with, with that in mind, what I did is just send an email out to the faculty and ask them if they had any questions and ask them to engage the students that are in their courses too to see what questions they might have. Uh, to date, I have 13 pages, and the emails were still coming in. Uh, the, the person who wins for most questions is Andy Heyer's class with three pages, so congratulations to them. They're actually uh, taught through a distance uh, format. One of the things you may see also is that um, we are filming this piece so that we can use it in other courses, but many of the courses that we teach are in a distance platform. And this will enable us to share that with some of the other students who, who are unable here, to be here today. Um, one of the things that uh, I know, and how, how many students are in here? Could you raise your hands? That's great. Um, I know that some of the students uh, may have come here with an assignment, and you're probably wondering how you get proof that you came here. So at the end of the presentation, outside the door they'll be handing out these certificates. This is not your degree. You're not done yet, okay? Um, but this is a way to show that you were able to come and participate in this event. Um, the other thing that we'd like to do with questions, have you noticed those little cards that you're sitting on or maybe you noticed and picked it up before you sat down? Um, we're going to have a, a variety of questions out here that are probably going to generate more questions. So what I would like you to do is uh, as the presentation is going on and as uh, some ideas pop into your head, be sure and write down a question for us. Uh, what we're going to do is take the 13 pages of questions that we have now and any questions that are generated through this, put it on our website, but we'll also be bringing some of those questions in so that we can use them during the presentation to kind of be, have questions that are relevant to the discussions that are going on now. Um, so you can just, this is just like church, right? You're going to pass them to the right and someone's going to buy, come by and collect those uh, and uh, you'll be able to share your questions that way. Well, um, I'm... I'm really excited to have a panel like this. And um, I want to first start by introducing um, uh, our board of ambassadors that we have here uh, in the College of Health Science. And this is a group of folks that are involved in a variety of key roles in health that help advise me and other members in the College of Health Sciences on things we should be considering and doing uh, in in the College of Health Sciences. And those kind of rotate around two main areas. It, it has to do with research agendas and what kind of teaching and experiences and programs we should be involved with. It also provides a really great way to create dialogue between higher ed and the community. Um, and, and that flow of information, I think, is critical. So um, with that in mind, I'm going to start uh, to my left, and I'm going to skip Ted just for a second because he's our keynote speaker here, um, and introduce uh, Steve Millard. Um, many of you have these pamphlets, and you'll be able to read more about this, but I just want to give a brief overview. Um, as president of the Idaho Hospital Association, Steve Millard was the lead spokesman and advocate for state and federal issues and the legislature representing uh, the IHA agenda key and key political issues. He led the development of new policies and programs and served members to handle all media communications. Um, what, one of the things that's really impressive is that Steve has worked for the Idaho Hospital Association for 39 years and 23 of those years um, were as uh, the president and CEO. Will you please welcome Steve Millard?
We also are fortunate to have uh, Ed Dahlberg here. Ed served as the president and CEO for St. Luke's Health System from October 1988 until March of 2010 when he retired. Prior to that, he was executive vice president for St. Luke's Regional Medical Center from December 1985 through September 1988. Um, Ed has been on a very uh, on a number of very important associations. One of which he was chairman of the American Hospital Association Region Eight Policy Board. Um, and in visiting with Ed, he has a real passion around education. And one of his other community activities, even though he is retired, is ser <clears throat> excuse me is serving as a regional chair and board member for the Idaho Business for Education. Please welcome Ed. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Marty Gabika. Um, Dr. Gabika is uh, a board-certified family practice physician and the chief medical officer at HealthWise. Um, as a chief medical officer, Marty applies his long-term leadership and shared decision-making skills to help ensure all HealthWise products support patient-doctor relationships. He manages the medical review process with over uh, 90 physicians and creating accurate information. And many of you probably know what HealthWise is, but they do a lot of the background information for things like uh, WebMD, things like that, along with a lot of other products. Um, He's had a, a very uh, diversified career, but one of the interesting things that I thought he did was uh, a co-founder of the Idaho Wellness Center. And um, it was very innovative because that was in 1980 and it was based on prevention, self-care, shared decision-making. Um, that's something that's common language now, but believe me, in 1980 it wasn't. So uh, please welcome Dr. Marty Gabika. Uh, next, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dave Self, who uh, recently joined St. Luke's Health Partners as Vice President in October of 2014. Prior to that, he was the Senior Vice President for Marketing and Regional Director for Idaho, Washington, and Pacific Source Health Plans. He joined Pacific Source in 2009 after the acquisition of Primary Health, where he was President and Chief Operating Officer for three years. Prior to that, he worked for over a dozen years with Regents Blue Shield Idaho, Blue Cross of Utah, uh, has worked with companies on medical technology and forming key partner relationships. Please welcome Dave Self. Uh, next, we have uh, Chris Roth, who is the Senior Vice President and Chief Operating Officer for St. Luke's Health System, which comprises seven hospitals, the Children's Hospital, a nationally recognized cancer center, and more than 100 clinics throughout southern Idaho and eastern Oregon. Uh, he previously served as the Chief Executive Officer for St. Luke's Treasure Valley and operations in Boise and the surrounding area. He's taken on leadership positions in a variety of areas, including New Orleans, Seattle, and is involved uh, with the community, as all these folks are, uh, currently as chair of the Idaho March of Dimes chapter. Please welcome Chris Roth. I also want to uh, introduce uh, Dick Armstrong, who was appointed director for the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare in June 2006 by Governor Jim Rich. Uh, he was appointed to the position in 2007 by uh, Governor Otter. Director Armstrong serves as executive and administrative head for the department, which employs approximately 2,800 people with expenditures of approximately $2.5 billion. Prior to this position, he was Vice President of Sales and Marketing at Blue Cross of Idaho, where he worked for 36 years. Please welcome Dick Armstrong. So um, this idea came up to have this panel during one of our meetings, because we have some great meetings. And uh, I have to say, I learn much more from the meetings than I think I'm able to provide to this group. So we thought it would be great to offer this out to uh, students and faculty and staff. And one of the things we thought was really key is to start it off with a presenter. And the person who na whose name came up first was uh, Dr. Ted Epperly. And uh, they said, Ted's a great speaker, and he is also one of the most knowledgeable people in the United States on this topic. Um, and so 
with that in mind, I want to take a second to introduce Ted. Ted is uh, first and foremost a family physician. He lives here in Boise, Idaho. He's also the president and CEO of the Family Medicine Residency of Idaho and clinical professor of family medicine at the University of Washington School of Medicine in Seattle. Um, Ted is very involved in a variety of professional organizations that are outlined in his bio. One of the things that I found very interesting is that he also had a, a career and retired as a colonel in the U.S. Army. Um, he has spoken across the United States hundreds of times. He has written close to 50 academic journals, uh, published books and chapters. And um, as you see in here, has testified to Congress regarding critical issues such as family medicine, primary care, health care workforce, access to care, medical homes. Um, and he has been ranked by modern health care as one of the 100 most influential people in health care. Please welcome Dr. Ted Epperly. Well, I'm uh, very pleased with that introduction by Tim. My wife would agree with him. My sons absolutely would not. <laughs> and I think that's the challenge we all have, don't we, in life. What I'd like to do uh, is share with you quickly, 20 minutes, I could talk for hours. Uh, so could any of these fine gentlemen uh, on the DS as well. But what I'd like to do is take about 20 minutes and put into some degree of context the complexity of what's happening in the nation with health care reform and why, and dial that down into Idaho, and then dial that down into what it means for the future of health care education uh, in this country, and dial it then down to what it means for you. Now, the panel will help expand on this, as will your questions. Trust me, two hours will go very quickly in this format. And so with 20 minutes to go, uh, I'll get I'll get started. The first thing I'd like to do is just to speak about kind of why we're here. What's led the United States, one of the greatest countries in the history of this planet, to struggle with what we do for the next stage, if you will, for health care for the people of our country? Well, we're, we're facing a bunch of problems. First and foremost is we still have about 34 million uninsured people. Now this is down from 50 million that we had just about uh, five, six years ago. But 34 million still is the cumulative population of 15 of the states in the United States. It's an average sized European country. And the problem is when you don't have everybody covered, then a lot of people live sicker and they die younger. Second is that we've got the wrong focus on what we're doing in health care. It should be about health, right? But what we do in medicine is really disease care. We take care of a lot of disease. And we're really good of taking care of a lot of disease. What we're not so good at is making sure those diseases don't happen. Why? Because we get paid to do things to people, not to prevent us doing things to people. And you have to understand that. Because what has driven American medicine is money. It's a very lucrative system. And I'm not up here to disparage that. I'm a physician in the system too. But we've got to get back to what this is about. And what it's about is keeping people healthy. Next is that we've got the wrong delivery model to do that with. If you will, we've got the wrong team on the field. If we're going to focus on health, then it's about having a lot more primary care physicians about a lot more sites of timely access to health care, as opposed to reactive episodic care where people end up either in the emergency room or hospital ORs or in the hospital. We need to project the workforce out and to keep people healthy. I mean, think about it. None of you here wants to be in an emergency room or an OR or a hospital if you don't need to be. I don't. I want to be functional and healthy. I want to be doing my thing. And I want a system to wrap around me to allow me to do that thing. And so we need to then think about how do we change this model to get to that. Because of this, we have staggering costs. 
weighing in at about $3 trillion. It's the largest sector in the entire American economy. So as you can imagine, if you're going to try to change a $3 trillion industry, there are going to be a lot of people that are not going to be happy with that. We also have quality problems. You'd think, and many people did for a long time, that America provided the best health care in the world. If you take a look at where the United States ranks, according to the World Health Organization, we rank 37th. And if you take a look at that ranking, who's in 36th place right above us is Costa Rica. Now, I have nothing against Costa Rica. Beautiful place. Hope to go there one day. But I know that the will of the United States can do better than that if we truly choose to focus on that. And lastly, because of all of this, we had a lot of health care insurance problems. We had a, people, a lot of people that not only were uninsured, as I'd mentioned, but a lot of people who couldn't get health care. And if they did, then they could be denied the potential for reissuance of that insurance if they developed serious medical concerns or issues. There were issues of what are called rescissions, meaning that you could be cut from your medical insurance because you developed a serious problem. There were lifetime and annual caps on how much the insurer would pay for your care. My point is, is that there were a lot of issues even if you had insurance as well. Adding to those roughly 36 to 50 million that were uninsured were about 135 million more that were underinsured, meaning that you couldn't rally enough resources to potentially pay for what could happen to you. Now all of you, hopefully, as students at Boise State or faculty here have some degree of coverage. But if you haven't, or your family members haven't, and I'm sure all of you can relate to someone you know that has been in this circumstance, you are basically one heartbeat away from disaster. You are basically one heartbeat away from potentially being bankrupt. The largest cause of bankruptcy in this country is from health care expenses. Now, I know that's not how we intended the system to work, but it's what we have. So let me show you this slide real quick. This is what happens to a course of 1,000 people. It could be in Boise. It could be in Tampa, Florida. It could be in San Francisco. It could be in rural America in the course of a month. And I know this is a little bit hard for you to see, and perhaps Dr. Dunnigan will have these slides uh, posted for you to see. I'm more than happy to have those shared with you liberally. But if you start in the upper right-hand corner, there's a thousand people. Could be, you know, close to half of us in this room today. 800 of those will have some degree of symptoms in the course of a month. Think of yourself in terms of having some sort of symptoms in the last month yourself. 327 will consider seeking medical care. 217 will. 65 will go to an alternate or complementary health care provider. 21 will visit a hospital outpatient clinic. 14 will receive home health care. 13 will go to an ER. 8 will be hospitalized. 1 will go to a quaternary academic medical center into an ICU setting. Now I ask you, taking a look at that, where do you think the majority of the spend of close to $3 trillion occurs in America's healthcare system. And I've heard a couple responses, and you're right. It would be in the bottom three to four boxes. Now let me ask you as well, where do you think the majority of medical and nursing education occurs in our country? And you'd also be right if you said those bottom three to four boxes. My point in showing this is that we do exactly what we've been trained to do and what pays well to do, and that's to take care of disease. It's not to prevent diabetes. It's to handle the renal failure that happens from it through dialysis or amputation. It's the downstream care that starts to accumulate, leading to higher costs, leading to poor quality. And so again, I'm not trying to bust on our health care system. We've gotten here for a reason. The reason has been around the incentives to do things, not to prevent things. And it's a critical point in your understanding. So what I've come to recognize 
about the American healthcare system can be summarized in this slide. We have built the world's best fire departments. We're really good at putting out fires. The problem is, is that our focus should be on preventing those fires in the first place. There's what it was in 2014, 2013 at 2.8 trillion, weighing in close to $3 trillion now. There is the spend projection as we go forward in time. That's why this has become a huge deal. There's the percent of the gross domestic product that's sucked into the black hole of healthcare if we don't get on top of this. 1935, back in the day of FDR, 3.8% of the GDP was going into healthcare. 2009 at about 16%, weighing in at roughly about 18% of the GDP right now. 2025 at 25% and 50% at 2082. Why this became a huge issue in the 2008 presidential election was because of the insolvency of Medicare in 2023 with the system as it stood now. If we don't start to bend the cost curve, we are looking at one out of every two dollars produced in the history's richest country, in the history of this planet, going into healthcare. That's unsustainable. It would be like me putting a 50 pound rock on your back and taking you up to Lucky Peak Reservoir and having you try to swim across the reservoir. Trust me, I don't care how good of a swimmer you are, you're going down. Our health care system and our nation is going down with health care costs. What I've come to recognize is this metaphor. I'm a sports guy. Love Boise State football, by the way. Love Boise State basketball, by the way. So this metaphor of a basketball team seems apt. Here is what our health care system does with the metaphor of basketball. We give every single player, and we've got the five best players on the planet. We've got wonderful physicians, we've got wonderful hospitals. But here's what our system does. We give them each a ball, we ask them to, random around, to dribble around at random and shoot at will, and every time they shoot the ball, they get paid. Doesn't matter if you make a basket or not. It's just you're hoisting up a shot. So imagine now in your mind's eye, all these players are just the best in the world. They're hoisting these shots up as fast as they can. Just imagine the arcing balls, most air balls, some clanking off the backboard, some clanking off the iron, some going through. But every time they shoot, they get paid. And then we play a team like Argentina, or Spain, or Portugal, or Switzerland, or England, or Canada, or New Zealand, or Taiwan, and we get beat. Now how? Do the five best basketball players on the planet get beat by Portugal, or England, or France, or Germany? And the reason we do is that we don't pass the ball. We shoot the ball. We don't get paid to pass. We get paid to shoot. And so we do what we get paid to do, and that's shoot the ball. It's not that we don't have the best technology, the best buildings, the best people, even with the best motives. It's that our system sucks. <laughs> and that's why it takes a model change to try to get the system right. Now, I grew up playing pinball. Many of you, as I look out in the audience, probably have heard of pinball. <laughs> Some of you may have played it. It was a great game. And what the idea was in pinball is you kept that ball bouncing around between cushions and racking up as many points as you can. And what I came to also recognize is a metaphor to have this stick in your mind is it's like a game of pinball. The problem is, is that it's the patient that's bouncing around between the bumpers, racking up dollars. And what we need to control that is integration and coordination of care at the basic entry level of care, which is at primary care. Albert Einstein, great guy, one of my favorites, defined insanity like this, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. 
if we don't change the model, if we continue with reactive episodic care, if we continue with looking at disease as being our focus, instead of the health of the individual, the health of the community, the health of the population, we will continue to get what we do. We've gotten really good at doing what we do. But the problem is, is that the cost is unsustainable. So, the Commonwealth Fund came out with a great article a couple years ago in terms of what improves healthcare outcomes the most. And it boiled down to two things. Number one, that people have some type of insurance coverage so that they don't put off things, that they don't feel like they can't afford it. And two, is that they have a usual source of care. They're not ricocheting around in the pinball machine. That you can establish a relationship, have trust with someone, I mean, we do this all the time. I do. I go to the same barber. I like him. He does a great job for me. I go to the same mechanic. Does a great job with my cars. I trust him. It should be like that for healthcare too. A relationship with someone you trust who can help you through the system, can help not only know and work with you around your choices, around what you want, but help you make sure that you don't get things done to you that you don't need done. Because I'm here to tell you, in medicine, more is not always better. More can be harmful. So this whole concept of the patient-centered medical home, just a show of hands, I'm curious. How many out there have ever heard of this concept of the patient-centered medical home? Okay, thank you for your honesty. That's about 20%, I'd say. So the concept of the patient-centered medical home, you'll he hear more about. And simply put, I can summarize it in two words. It's a place because no provider is a patient-centered medical home. It's a clinic, a clinic where you get a usual source of care. And it's noted because of the process, the second word there, of care you get there. Team-based, integrated, coordinated, focusing in a patient-centered way to keep you healthy. That's the patient-centered medical home. Timely access, timely portals into the system. Not reactive, not waiting, not having access problems, so you have to use a higher cost setting downstream like an emergency room. Now all of us will have times when we need to go to the ER. Bad accident, bad cut, heart attack in the middle of the night, thank God they're there for that. But that's not where usual sources of care should be, not to keep you healthy and functional. In fact, I would even say it shouldn't even be in a clinic. It should be in your home. We have software systems that can do that. Wouldn't you better and be more happy interacting with software in a way that's thinking about you as a person, what your health characteristics are, and working with you to achieve that. We can do that. We're very close to having, you know, both systems that can handle that, but get to know you and your preferences as well. It takes model change. So this whole concept of the patient-centered medical home can be looked at in terms of a medical home neighborhood also surrounding that. That's the integration and coordination then of other clinics, hospitals, other community services, all of it working on your behalf to be coordinated. Now it's amazing to me, in the age of technology and information we have, I can use my ATM card at any ATM machine around this world and I can get cash usually within 30 seconds. Well, I'm here to tell you I can't get medical information about you from across the street. So again, there's ways in which we can start to think about how information should flow, how we keep it patient compliant and safe, but in a way that's working for your best interests. This whole idea can be taken to the accountable care organization level too. And what an ACO is, and you've probably heard that terminology, just like patient-centered medical homes 
or medical home neighborhoods may be new to you today. The concept of an accountable care organization is this same concept now applied to a larger healthcare system around integration and coordination of care. If you will, passing the ball. Passing the ball. I love symphonies. I marvel at their complexities. Last night, I was in Las Vegas. Last night, I heard Elton John. Wow. You should go sometime. Put it on your to-do list. My wife took me for a birthday present. I said, thank you, Lindy. How many times in my life am I ever going to see Elton John? My point is, is that it was a marvel of synchronized, integrated, and coordinated music. Think of this symphony and how it can play together, but also now think of it if it's not playing together. The cacophony of sound you get. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you, our healthcare system is not on the same sheet of music. We're starting to work towards it. We're starting to work towards the beauty of that sound, but we're not there. What hallmarks the best healthcare systems in the world are their ability to work together to integrate and to coordinate that message in ways that are understandable and provide better healthcare outcomes. Now I want to spend just a couple minutes and dial this into Idaho. Many of you have heard around the concepts of the SHIP grant or healthcare transformation, Medicaid redesign, and Medicaid expansion. These are three intricate policies but all tied together. The first big red oval there is around health system transformation. We received a $40 million grant from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation Center to transform healthcare in the state of Idaho. We're going to do it around the concepts I just shared with you. Robust primary care, the patient-centered medical home, passing the ball in an integrated and coordinated way. Medicaid redesign is the redesign of our entire Medicaid system so that patients can be put into a system that's more functional for them and which they're accountable for their health care activities and their health care behaviors so that it produces better health downstream for them, for the community. Medicaid expansion is all about making sure patients less than 100% of the federal poverty level, which is about $14,000 for an individual, $22,000 in earning for a family of four will have some sort of coverage. Right now, those individuals in Idaho fall in a gap. And so what we're trying to do is achieve two things, right? Two things, Commonwealth Fund, some sort of coverage for people, and a usual place of care. So here's Idaho, great state. We're going to put patient-centered medical homes all across this state. Their existing practices, we're going to transform them to this upper level of integrated and coordinated care. They're going to be distributed across the state. 165 of these practices will be created. More to follow over time. Patient-centered medical homes will be what they are, and they're going to appear here as the circles. We're then going to have seven regions of the state become regional collaboratives in terms of integrated, integrating and coordinating that care because all health care is local so that, if you will, those medical home neighborhoods can start to work on behalf of patients in ways that are helpful to the person and to their health. And the Idaho Health Care Coalition, which is a governor-appointed board that oversees this $40 million grant that I'm talking to you about is going to help over the next four years drive that sort of system of care into our state. Now, last couple slides. How does this impact health care education? And how will these changes in health care change? Uh, how will these changes in health care change what we teach and how we teach it? First and foremost, it's going to have a profound impact. We've got a huge number of people aging in this country. The tsunami of us baby boomers is incredible. 10,000 people a day 
will turn age 65 for the next 20 years in our country. That's a huge number of people. And we know that the Medicare population carries the highest cost. We must get on top of how we're starting to manage then health versus just reactive disease. It's going to have implications for you all that are interested in health care in terms of the creation of a broad workforce and technologies that, that start to support that. Not technologies for episodic reactive care, but technologies to keep people functional and healthy in their home. We want to focus on health versus disease. That's going to be a big deal. We've got the intelligence as a nation to do this. We want to focus on, focus on function versus dependence. Again, think of your parents or your grandparents, for many of you, in terms of what they would want with their life. They certainly would want to stay as functional and healthy as possible, and we want to drive this by lowering cost. How many here have heard of the concept of the triple aim? So maybe 10% of the room. The triple aim is the focus on what we're trying to achieve with three outcomes. One, better health for people. Number two, better health care as a process for people. And number three, lower costs. That's the triple aim. You'll hear probably more about that uh, in the future. So in, in terms of what we teach and how we teach, the what, we want to start to focus more on the community. We want to start to focus more on outpatient ambulatory-based or home-based health care. Technology needs to be developed to help assist that. We need to use computers to help monitor that in ways that, again, is a talk unto itself, but I can manage my population of 17,000 patients in our clinics in which we start to focus on keeping them healthy using a green, yellow, red grid of how they're doing and the biometric information they put in on a daily basis through their laptops or smartphones that come to my system and I can array all those patients with diabetes and hyperlipidemia and hypertension and HIV and uh, emphysema and asthma in ways in which I know at any point in time how they're doing. And we can reach out to those that are yellow with a phone call in terms of Mrs. Smith, I notice your peak flow, your airflow production is diminished from the biometric information you just put into the, your laptop today. We need to think about what's going on. Let's increase your inhaler. Let's try this and we'll keep watching, keep putting in the information. They're red, I see them that day. I don't need to see all the green people. In fact, we push out ed education to those people to keep them that way. Yellows, they get a contact. Red, we're seeing. Think about that in terms of managing the population better. It needs to be person-centered. What are your goals? What are your outcomes? It needs to be integrated. It needs to be coordinated. I'll finish with a case example. We've got a 74-year-old rancher, heart failure for the last three days. He lives up in sweet Idaho. He loves his ranch. 240 acres, got a lot of cows, been healthy pretty much all his life. Ignored his hypertension, though. Darn it, it's too bad. Led to downstream problems in terms of heart disease, in particular with heart failure. Now he's in, he's been handled in the office, real patient of mine. We get him turned around with a short hospitalization, return him home because we want to keep him there. We start to manage him in a different way. Daily weights are put in, oxygen saturations that he can put in through laptops, medication adjustments, televideo if necessary to his house by Skype, as opposed to him coming all the way back to Boise. We get the nutritionist involved to talk with him at his home, occupational therapy to advise him and his wife on what to do in his house. Same with physical therapy through what they can do, maybe a home nurse. Uh, may need to be involved to see him. Pharmacy can help oversee this electronically so that we can all focus on his best interests. Computer assisted instruction so that we can educate him and his wife as to what to watch for in the future. Community health workers can make visits to his place on his ranch as opposed to him coming down here. And we can avoid, which we did, 
downstream ER utilization, downstream hospitalizations, provided him, provided him a higher function in his life, all with that last bullet point as being our mantra. The highest quality of care is close to home as possible. So, <clears throat> in summary, healthcare reform and the future of higher education, it will be profound. It already is. I hope you have a deeper context now of why this is such a big deal. It will absolutely demand more people going into healthcare and being used more effectively in terms of efficiency, computerization and technology, population health management. It's going to be intertwined and synergistic with what we do to help focus on keeping people healthy. It'll be ambulatory based and functional, not that we won't need people to still be in ERs, to still be in hospitals for those that need it. But those will be much less, won't they? It'll probably lead to some degree of, of both integration of, of systems. Probably some places won't need to be present like they are. Denmark, 25 years ahead of us on this journey, went from 140 hospitals to 40 hospitals over the course of that time period as they started to integrate and coordinate health better. It needs to be cost effective and it needs to be a value add. With that, I appreciate your attention. I hope you've learned some things here. And now listen to what our panel has to say about what this means to you. And I look forward to engaging with you further about deeper conversations around a very important topic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Epperly. Um, you know, I'm just going to throw uh, something out. And by the way, I know uh, folks have classes where they have to come and go. Uh, unless you have a back like mine and need to stand back there, you can. Otherwise, there are seats. And I checked, everyone took a shower, so even the ones here in the front are safe. So uh, please sit down. There's opening, open areas out here. Um, this idea I want to throw out, with the reconfiguration of the college, one of the things we're looking at is trying to um, look at ways we promote the health of the university for the students, the faculty, staff, and doing that through our, our wellness programs and incorporating it into our clinic. So as we go through these conversations today, think about that because that could be an interesting thing to participate in. Um, what I'd like to do now is um, go through the members of the panel and ask them to talk for two minutes to share one item um, that higher education should be addressing in the next five years and to please tell us why you think this item is of importance. So we'll start with Steve Millard. Well, I, <clears throat> it may be um, good or bad to go first because uh, I can easily take what everybody else would say, but you said only one thing, so I'll, uh, I'll stick with that. First of all, I want to admit that I'm not a, a, a Bronco. I'm a Bengal. I played football at Idaho State many, many years ago. But I'm a huge, huge Bronco fan and a Boy State fan. Uh, I had a list of about four things. I, I guess one of the things that stri strikes me is, is how we treat our patients in hospitals. I don't think we treat them as customers. I don't think we look at them as de delivering customer service to them. And I think that's an educational thing as well as uh, just learning on the job. But uh, I had uh, heard a speaker last spring in a national meeting, and he does research on healthcare opinions, what the public opinion on healthcare are. And he does it by polling and by uh, focus groups. And he said one of the biggest problems hospitals have, according to the public, is they act like hospitals. They don't act like businesses that succeed in customer service. They act like hospitals. So my point, uh, Dr. Dunnigan, is, is we need to teach better customer service. Great, thanks. And I appreciate you. Uh, 
uh, kind of making that confession about being a Bengal, it gets easier once you do it, say it publicly. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, next we have uh, Ed Dahlberg. Ed, Tim, thanks. And and uh, being uh, one of the retired guys on the panel here, and maybe having a different perspective than some of the real workers uh, that you might hear from. Let me let me take a, a, a little bit different approach, um, but I think tie it in for you. Uh, the reason we have reforms in the country are because we're not meeting the expectations of those to whom we deliver service. Something's being asked of us that we aren't delivering. And the two greatest social programs that are being called for and reformed today are education and health care. So those of you who are sitting in the room are getting a double whammy. You're looking at a a reform of your education system and what it's doing and the healthcare system in which you're going. Let me, by the way, say thanks to you for coming into the healthcare field. We, we need you desperately and we're, 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 we're glad to have all of you coming along. I think the caution I would send you and the preparation I would ask the universities and, and education system to help us prepare for is that you haven't seen reform yet. If you think what's happened has been the kind of reform we're going to face in the country. Uh, I've got some real surprises for you. They're not. Uh, we've had some reforms to access and some reforms to insurance, but we haven't had true reform to the health care delivery system. And we need to address uh, many of the things that uh, were addressed um, by Ted in the opening speeches, but we can't go, when, when I was uh, young in this career, we were spending 7% of our income, of gross domestic product on health care, now approaching 20%. People say when it gets to be 10%, it's gonna, the system will implode. So when it's going to implode, I don't know. But reform is not going to be driven by government. It's going to be driven by you folks. And so the attachment there is that I would ask that universities help with things that like this, to give you the perspective and the picture of what's happening on the top, in the big picture of things, so that you have an appreciation of what is happening, but also a perspective that says, how can I contribute to providing better health care, but consuming fewer resources? The solution in this country is not going to be more resources. It's going to be acting and behaving and doing smarter things than before. So we need you to leave this university with a little bit better perspective on what's happening on the big scene, not just your technical skills, uh, for which we uh, give you great credit, but also understanding why things are being done and why they're happening the way they are. Thanks. Thanks, Ed, and that's a great parallel about the changes that are needed in higher education and in healthcare. Uh, both are going through these radical transformations. So, Dr. Gabika. My point is similar to Ed's. I have a name for it. I call it health consumerism. We're going to graduate a few thousand students every year. They're going out into the job market, and they're going to be offered a set of benefits. Do you know what a benefit is? Do you know what a copay is, what coinsurance is? Knowing all those terms and how to be a smart consumer in your, ins in your health insurance is very important. The, the second piece of that is how do I get the most out of the health care system? We're moving from a fee-for-service health care system to a fee-for-value health care system. You're going to participate in deciding what's good value in my health care. How do you do that? We need to teach you how to make those decisions. Of that three trillion dollars we're spending every year, it's thought that somewhere around 30% is wasted, unnecessary, or repetitive. We need to be teaching you, your students how to make some decisions that help introduce my needs, my wants, my values in deciding around procedures, in deciding around providers, and deciding around facilities. Thanks, Marty. I, I really appreciate your comment, too, about health consumers. And I have to think that um, at a university, we have a job. And part of that training is something that needs to take place. So, uh, Dave Self. Dave, you're up. I'd like to thank Dr. Epperly for taking all the good analogies. 
<laughs> so, so I'm going to talk about the Super Bowl with this serious young man who clearly likes the Patriots. I'm a Seahawks fan. Go Hawks. Um, he's looking, he wants to take me out right now. Some good points have been made so far, and, and I'd like to talk specifically about your education. If you're involved in getting into the healthcare industry, if you're involved today, raise your hand, please. I hate it when people do that, but I want to make a point. If every person that raised their hand was going to be an MD, we would not have enough MDs if you look at the calculus of what it takes to take care of an aging nation. And that means that we really need to rethink the caregiver. We need you to operate at the top of your new license. And that license should look different from what it has traditionally. A multidisciplinary approach so that we can address the needs that my colleagues have touched on that Dr. Epperly talked about as his rancher patient. How do we address those needs? You are part of that solution. Dr. Gabika touched on another one of the points, too, which is tough going forth because everybody's taking them one by one. Dick is in a really bad spot down there. The, the pay for value versus pay for volume, you will bring that value. And as you go through your education, think about the ways that you bring value in giving care and providing care, not just to older people, but to everyone in the continuum. I think that's one of the best and highest uses of people entering the healthcare industry today is rethinking the role, being creative, and being innovative. And as Ed said, thank you for, for your participation and, and for your passion because great caregivers today takes more than compassion and science. It takes innovation as well. Thanks, Dave. And um, I'm glad you brought up scope of practice. There are a number of questions that came up on that. Maybe we'll get into a little more detail. So Chris Roth, you're up. Thank you. Uh, and Dr. Epperly, thank you. Those were great comments. And Dick, you should be scared because I've looked at all his notes and I'm going to recite them <laughs> here. Just, uh, just kidding. Well, I'd like to take a little different slant. I, I agree with all the comments that have been made uh, thus far, but I'd like to te uh, talk a little bit about aligned incentives and Dr. Eppertley spoke about this, and he said, uh, quote, we have the wrong team on the field. I think that's one of the things he, he mentioned. And I'll give a couple of examples that uh, I've just saw recently in, in the world of healthcare. One was last week where a physician, excellent physician, a specialist, was talking about a pilot program he was putting on in his clinic, and that was where a nurse practitioner would see the new patients in this complex specialty, but the evidence had shown that actually the nurse practitioner, uh, even for a new patient, could do this assessment uh, as effectively or, or perhaps better than uh, the physician over time. And his comment was, you know, the problem is that I get paid for the new patients and there is, goes revenue out the door and, and I'm not gonna see the income for that patient. And that's an amazing physician, but just an example of, of misaligned incentives. Another one where I saw a team of caregivers rounding on a patient. Makes sense, okay? So chaplain, social work, pharmacist, physician, nurse, rounding together on a critical care patient, talking about the needs of this individual patient. And uh, I asked about how that team got set up. You'd think as a, as a, a lay person, somebody in the community, well, shouldn't you be doing that anyway? It is amazing how difficult it is to get caregivers of different disciplines to come together and perform team-based medicine. And so uh, I really have two messages, not only for you, but also for uh, uh, the uh, Boise State University. As we look at training our future workforce, we really have to train in teams and get people early on not going for, hey, I'm the top of the class, it's all about me, what are my grades, that's certainly important, but how do we create environments where we put healthcare professionals together so that they understand that it is a symphony. Everybody has their part in, in the work, whether it's administration, whether it's physicians, whether it's medical assistants, whether it's billing and others, and the lack of alignment, not only with our team and people, but our also, also our financial incentives, has created the system that we have today. And just a final note, think about the time when we do have complete alignment as an industry 
with our financial assist, uh, uh, financial and, and other areas that we need to get aligned. Think about what's going to happen in technology and the technology revolution we're going to experience. It's ironic in that we have some of the most advanced technology in the world in operating rooms and MRIs and all the things we use to do things to people. But what, hap what will happen when incentives are aligned and the technology revolution hits healthcare and we start to implement things that really make a difference in preventative care and the things that are being shut out of the system today because they're gonna gore somebody's ox along the way. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, I, one of the things I'd like to uh, mention with that is that in the college we've been working strategically to do more interprofessional education. Um, but, and, and, and there's work that needs to be done with that. It, it's a slow process because really we've been siloed for years. Um, but also we need to look across to business. Um, we need to look at engineering. So it's not only within our college, it's across areas. And I think um, people are pretty receptive to the idea of teams, but uh, it's another thing to do it. So uh, next, we have Dick Armstrong. Dick, you're up. With the last name Armstrong, I'm not used to going last. <laughs> <laughs> and this was a setup. Um, and unlike uh, the fellow that started, um, <clears throat> I'm a BSU class of 70, uh, which is a long time ago, but I recognized a couple buildings on the campus. <laughs> uh, coming from health and welfare, we are the state uh, behavioral health authority and mental health authority. And uh, while we've talked about silos and we've talked about fragmented care, uh, mental health has been the most fragmented of all. Uh, it has been isolated because of payment and benefit policy and payment policy for, well, since uh, beginning of time. And here we are now talking about an integration. And that integration means uh, that those of you that are uh, social workers, those that are you in, in psychiatry and psychology, and those other disciplines, which historically really never talked to the physical medic medicine folks, you will. Because there is, uh, there will be, in very short order, a need to bring this integration together. Uh, we know that in mental health that those folks suffering from severe and persistent mental illness will die approximately 25 years younger than uh, those that don't. And it's not the mental illness that causes them to, to pass. It is because of the mental illness they don't care, uh, take care of their physical medicine problems. And our healthcare system today doesn't really cross over. It doesn't recognize those two different disciplines. But it has to and it will. And so we're gonna see this merging of these disciplines, the physical medicine and the behavioral health. Uh, and I think that uh, this, this uh, change at Boise State in your curriculum is on the right track because it's a way of bringing these teams together so you start talking together and, and working as a team and depending on each other, trusting each other uh, to carry out your specific discipline. Physical medicine is used to curing things and doing things as, as Dr. Epperly mentioned. Uh, behavioral health is a lifetime chronic disease that will always be managed. And so it is a very different discipline that uh, they'll have to be entered uh, as we go through this integration. Uh, but it's exciting. Um, I think it is, a, it is a, a, a long overdue event, and I'm certainly glad that uh, my professional career has allowed me to be part of uh, making this happen. So thank you. Thank you, Dick. And I, I uh, appreciate all the comments, but particularly the, the bringing together the mental health and physical health and tries to help explain some of the changes that have taken place in the college with social work recently coming in, but uh, um, having a variety of their clinical programs that are involved in there. So I, I hope this has primed the pump. This is a pretty meaty issue that we're getting into. So as you get a chance, why don't you start writing down some questions and then pass those to the side as we go along. We're going to move on to some uh, questions that were sent in by students, uh, faculty, and staff. And um, we're not going to be nearly this orderly in, in the process. So as I put a question out, if it uh, kind of uh, uh, hits a, a mark for you or it's something that you want to share on, just 
feel free to go with that. I'm going to kind of act as a moderator too. We have a lot of questions. I, I wasn't kidding when I said 13 pages. Um, and the hard part was really there were so many good ones to figure out which ones to bring in. So I'll kind of move us on to questions so we get through this. Um, but the first one comes from Dr. Sarah Taves and Community Environmental Health. And um, one of the courses that we have in the graduate programming over there is a course in program evaluation. I used to teach that, and I know it's one of the courses that students get most excited about to take, particularly when you have statistics and things like that in there. You're a tough group. I know that's funny. Um, but um, her question is, and this relates back to some of the things Ted was saying, achieving the triple aim of quality and value at a population health level requires a rethinking of metrics used to measure success. How have the strategies used to measure monitor success changed with healthcare reform? Um, and the other piece that she was interested in is um, how you go about um, what should I, and this is for the students, be learning in my master's degree program to be competitive in the job market from an evaluation standpoint? Either one of those questions you can take on. Well, I'll, 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 I guess I'll jump in first just quickly. Um, and I want to pick up on a point uh, that, uh, that Mr. Dahlberg had mentioned too. And that is that, uh, can you hear me? Is this working for you all? I just want to make sure, okay. Uh, the metrics that we choose uh, will be really important in the sense of, again, we just don't want data, we want information. And we want it about the right things. So we want to, we want to drive a system that's looking, again, much more towards health and best practices in terms of managing chronic disease. I think it's working a little better now. So population health metrics that start to look across either communities or regions are going to be important. So what percent of people in your community or region, work with me here, those seven population centers in Idaho, what percent of people have hypertension there? I can tell you right now, nobody has any clue. I can also tell you then what percent of those people are on appropriate medications to have their blood pressure at control? I'm here to tell you nobody can answer that question. So just imagine now if we start to use a metrics in our system that start to really give us population based statistics that we can look at in terms of how we best manage that population start to then use educational systems to drive then better compliance and behavior change. This is one of the points I wanted to get to that Mr. Dahlberg mentioned. Behavior change becomes one of the singly most important things we can do. It's not new designer antibiotics or new cancer treating medications. It is an individual's personal behavior. If we want to change healthcare, we drive healthcare education and choice to the individual level as measured by the population and help people understand why it is that that behavior change will help them, thus the population. Well, Ed? I, I think you all know this, but there may be an assumption out there that, that you're entering into a real scientific arena where the solutions are already designed for us how we apply our skills to treat patients. I, I'm here to tell you, and I think this is a little bit what Ted was talking about, what I'm talking about, you gotta help us. There is huge variation across this country in the way patients are treated. There is huge variation in the resources assigned to patients to treat their illness. Now, I'm not suggesting to you that everything ought to be exactly the same down the line, but what we have an opportunity to do is to identify best practices, learn from each other, understand what resources and what uh, applications make the difference, and try to eliminate some of the waste and some of the expenditures that are going on that are going to be needed if we're going to reinvest into some of the things that are coming along into the future. 
these uh, macro level issues are really key around evaluation. I, I'm wondering, we have a lot of students in here. If they were coming in to do an interview, what kinds of things would you want to hear from them around their evaluation or analytical capabilities um, that would uh, strike you as a plus uh, when they have uh, five other people applying for the job too? It's probably 50. Yeah, and I might take a stab at that since I'm not hiring anybody these days. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think, you know, what we're look, what a business, uh, you know, what a business looks for is people who are going to bring value and add value to their organization. And I think those of us in, in healthcare have, um, we have skills on one side and we have judgment and autonomy on the other side. And each of these healthcare jobs may be, um, have different expectations in terms of um, what you need and where you go. Obviously, the skills and the technical capabilities, we need to be very good. But quite frankly, we think we can help once you get into that employment arena. We can help you hone some of those things specific to a unique organization or a unique um, um, entity. Um, what we really, m many people would say, we like to hire the best person. We'll make them. We'll, we'll bring their skills along to help us move along, but we need the right person. And what that means is the commitment to health care, it means the commitment to people, it means the commitment to learning. And as I tried to say a little bit earlier, I think when you have a broader perspective of what the mission of the organization is that you're, that you're going to be serving, how you're going to help that organization achieve its mission, and how you're con going to contribute to success by by uh, critically looking at the things we do and offering suggestions for improvement. I think that's going to uh, go a long way to, to, do, to moving you up. Chris? I'll, I'll just add on to that a little bit uh, and, and look at it from a more global perspective. And uh, there were a lot of comments about being customer focused and another insight into to healthcare. I've literally been in meetings with uh, uh, caregivers and others in, the, in the, the business, if you will, of healthcare, where there has been a debate of the word patient and customer. And of course, there are patients, but there are also customers. And uh, whether it's our loved one who's in the hospital and we're supporting them, we're a customer of, of the system. So on that note, relative to what, what I look for, uh, and it's, it's taken me some time to, 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 to focus on this, and, and certainly us as an organization as, as well. Just what Ed said, we can bring people skills along, and we expect that there's technical competency and training and education. But my opinion, this is my opinion, the single most valuable things that you can bring to the table is a positive attitude. And uh, because have, if any of you have ever been on the recipient on the receiving end of great service where you feel connected and supported, I guarantee the person on the other side uh, is probably smiling, probably has a positive attitude, and you can tell they care about what they're doing. So have a positive attitude. And if you don't, relative to the work that you're doing, you're probably in the wrong profession. Thanks for those comments. Um, I, I think it's interesting. I've yet to see a syllabus <clears throat> where we give out a grade for attitude. How would that go over? <clears throat> But obviously, um, we've heard from the last two folks uh, a very important thing in obtaining a job. Dick, I was uh, curious, um, with your perspective, uh, particularly in population health, this idea on evaluation or skills that you're looking for, we kind of evolved into that. Any comments there? Well, one of the things that reform will bring is a change in how we deal with population health, because up till now, uh, we do prevention programs. You've seen Project Filter for smoking cessation and other programs that we do. And we're out doing all of this anti-programming uh, uh, to counter uh, what the tobacco industry is, is spending advertising dollars on. As we look at this reform coming down the pike, we see integrating with the healthcare delivery system uh, and deliver our population health and our prevention programs really through the medical home because that's exactly where the contact is between the healthcare provider and and the patient and the one opportunity to actually start influencing behavior so 
we would look at those coming through public health also realizing that they're going to be interfacing through the healthcare delivery system as opposed to being, uh, you know, kind of on the outside, you know, trying to get people's attention. It will be coming from the inside. And so it's going to be, you know, some of the skills will be, you know, all of your interpersonal relation skills, uh, your sales ability. I mean, everybody comes to this world, uh, you're selling yourself or you're selling a product or you're selling a concept. And so it is how you present yourself. And those skills are, are going to be more and more valuable uh, in healthcare. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to dovetail into another question um, that I received, and because I'm hearing a lot of comments, certainly about the, um, the personality of a person and kind of what they bring into there. But I'm also hearing about uh, some things such as sales and things like that. And that typically comes out of another discipline. Um, that's in the area of business. So I received this question from the new dean of the uh, College of Business and Economics, uh, Dr. Ken Peterson. And here's the question. Do you see opportunities for traditional colleges like health science and businesses to work together to better address the healthcare industry's needs as it moves towards building sustainable business models for population-based healthcare? And maybe say something after yes or no with that to kind of fill in that piece. So sorry, I wasn't going to let you off that easily. You're so kind. Uh, well, we, we're going to be driven by data. And uh, Governor Otter has always uh, talked to us about uh, government it should be data driven. And we should be making our decisions uh, based on what we see within the populations we serve. So the, this, this uh, notion that all uh, business analytics were all about, you know, profit and loss statements, you know, in private industry. That's not at all what is happening now because we use those same techniques to determine returns on investments uh, through the programs that we deliver for people on uh, various, uh, you, know, uh, you know, support programs. Uh, we have to know that we're getting a return on it. We have to know that it's coming back in some way and you know, we've talked about what are the measures of success. Well, we're just starting to understand what those measures are going to be. And so we use, in, in health and welfare, we probably have uh, three dozen uh, business analysts. And these are people that are analyzing the statistics, telling us how we can improve and change direction. So there's a huge, uh, you know, merging of the business disciplines within uh, healthcare. Great, and I know um, we have a lot of other people on the panel who are kind of in the business of health, so I'm curious on other thoughts. Let me just uh, jump on this just quickly. Um, I talked about how the system sucked. So we need to tighten, if you will, the system. And I, I see business principles being really very well aligned with that. Um, continuous performance improvement needs to be done, if you will, both lean technologies, Six Sigma thinking needs to tighten up the healthcare industry. Uh, one of the speakers said, and it's true, uh, about a third of the healthcare costs, so almost a trillion dollars, is redundant, it is unnecessary, and it's duplicative. Think about just that alone in terms of dialing down 33% of healthcare costs by the system working better. I think business and business principles can help with that. Um, thanks, and I, I think I'm, I'm kind of hearing here uh, an opportunity for maybe uh, work that's done in the College of Health Sciences and work in business to kind of share both ways. Maybe uh, business students could benefit from some health backgrounds and population health, uh, but also students um, in the health sciences could benefit from some of the business practices also. Other thoughts on that? Well, you know, Tim, I, I might be the epitome of of this, having a business background and working in healthcare, uh, which I did, and I, I think there's tremendous opportunity. The, the very basic principle of business is having an organization or an entity that has defined its mission, knows what it wants to accomplish, structures itself accordingly, in other words, puts its organization together in a way that's going to be effective, creates a system to meet those objectives and benefits, meaning 
um, aligning the incentives, as Chris was talking about earlier, of its, of its employees and people who are helping you get there, rewarding them for that accomplishment, having outcomes designed that say well, we are going to be successful when we meet these outcomes, and then moving on to the next step to redefine those. Those are the va very basic principles of, of a business entity, which can be equally applied to healthcare, and I think there's great opportunity for it. Great. Dave, you look like you were going to say something. To follow on to what, what Ed <coughs> started uh, discussing, I think there's a, a critical thinking that comes from a good grounding in basic business principles. And if you understand the basic economics of healthcare, you can better understand the patient slash customer uh, that you're helping. Because when we align incentives for the provider community, that's one part of the equation. Aligning the incentives for the individual who's paying the bill is another. And if you are a caregiver, if you are involved in that value chain, understanding how best to help them, where to point them for additional resources, how to assure compliance in their course of care, that's important too. If you look at the average income in the great state of Idaho, I think household income hovers around forty-three dollars to $47,000, depending on where you are in the state. That's with two incomes. Um, you start talking about co-payments and co-insurances that Dr. Gabika mentioned earlier. That has a material impact on people's personal economy. And so if you've got good business sense, some critical thinking, you'll be better on that side of the equation. And if you're in interested in taking a look at the business analytics, business intelligence, being an analyst, and helping understand the behaviors in healthcare and how we can better deliver, then understanding the compassionate care side is important. So there's a real symbiotic relationship growing between both business and, and the College of Health Sciences. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, there's another aspect, too, that I don't think we've addressed, and that is the, the people that work in healthcare are highly trained, highly skilled in their health professions, but they know very little about business principles. Uh, and they're often placed in a position where they have to make business decisions, whether it's hiring, firing, whether it's uh, supervising employees, whether it's uh, putting together a budget. I, I think is you need to cross-train. That's, that's a really old-fashioned word, but it really makes sense to me. You need to have people have the skills that business people have, even if they're in healthcare, even if they're down the line in the organization, not just the leaders like Ed was, and a very good one, I might add. He was the chairman of my board once, so I have to say that. Doesn't matter. No. <laughs> uh, anyway, the, uh, I just think, uh, I think the combination of business and healthcare, I mean, they, you can't separate them. You really can't separate them. Um, Again, this, this seems like a, an interesting potential for uh, folks coming together. Um, I just uh, got a, some feedback from the group, too. Um, and this is not the entire board of, uh, of ambassadors uh, that's here. Some folks were asking questions. Uh, Zelda Geyer Sylvia, um, Marianne Reese. Uh, Zelda is the uh, uh, president and CEO of Blue Cross. And Marianne's a former graduate of our nursing program. and. Uh, she is in Illinois, um, and they were not able to attend today, so I just wanted to clear up some of that confusion for you. Um, again, I think there's uh, some really interesting potential around the business pieces and how we come together, and it's, again, this whole idea of partnerships uh, and how we come across not only within a college but across colleges to do that. Um, this next one, and I'm big on these, yes, you have one thing that you can contribute. So. Um, this comes from the director of our Office of Research, and um, one of the things Terry Solberg did was to go through and look at sources such as NIH and NSF and other areas, and how the funding was starting to come out around health care reform, and this is a big area that we can address. So I'd like to throw this out to the group. If um, you look at some of these areas, um, emerging and enhanced research, big data and analytics, chronic, chronic care disease management, role of mobile technology, support chronic care, uh, patient self-care, patient engagement, decision making, it went on and on, wellness, prevention. I'd like you to think about if you could only ask the students and faculty at Boise State to engage in one question 
what would that question be to address from a research standpoint? And um, Marty, I noticed as I was talking about decision support tools, um, self-care, that kind of resonated with some of the things that health-wise, I was wondering if you could throw a question out there. There's a um, body of knowledge developing <clears throat> across the country around this thing called shared decision making. And there is some evidence that we can improve on the triple aim if we engage people better in sharing in their own decisions about their health care. So shared decision making means if I'm confronted with a health decision where my preferences make a difference, option A and option B have the same outcome, does it, how do I engage that decision so that it works for me? So shared decision making refers to that. We think that more research in that arena will give us some direction into how we can improve the triple aim. Um, to your knowledge, are many universities engaging in this research? Is it an area that's been around for a while or is it relatively new? It's relatively new. There's only been about, well, there's been a few studies going on for about 20 years, but there are only um, two areas of excellence. I've talked to Tim about this before. There's two areas of excellence in the whole country on shared decision making. One of them is um, at, at uh, Dartmouth and another one is at Ottawa, actually, that's in Canada. BSU has a huge opportunity to become an expert in this field with um, pushing forward the research agenda there. Great, thanks. Other uh, research questions from the panel? Yeah, I, I would pick up on this point it, for me, and I've been a family physician for 35 years. I've seen a lot of patients. If we could dial in on the essence of behavior change, that would be the one thing that I think would drive best health for this nation. What, what is it that constitutes our choice? Either around exercise, nutrition, weight loss, number of steps I take a day, my compliance on medications, you fill in the blank. Speeding, driving too fast, not wearing a seat belt, that is a big deal. And if we could start to really put together what is the essence of how, you know, with as unique and diversity of population we have, can we help people get right to the essence of behavior change that starts to drive better healthcare choices? So no matter where you're at in your own healthcare journey, a sequence of different choices could start to be made that drives you towards better health. I'll submit to you that those choices are more powerful than any medication I'll ever write you for, or in the most part, any surgery you'll ever have. That is a big deal. And I, um, uh, Chris Roth was uh, mentioned this also, and I, I'm curious to follow up on uh, Ted's comments there. Chris, thoughts on what's limited our ability to move forward in this area? Um, things that may have prevented us from um, being able to find some of the answers and, and facilitate these behavior changes? Well, that's a huge question, and I, I think some are, are fairly obvious relative to our lack of uh, individual understanding around the system that we're uh, involved with, uh, the, the misalignment of incentives where we don't sometimes have personal skin in the game to, to want to take personal responsibility or accountability, whether that's us as individuals or providers or, or others. Uh, I think another uh, emerging issue is this uh, area of personal privacy and technology that we're going to be faced with because much what Dr. Epperly was talking about, there are models that exist now that can take our individual almost like a genetic code, but our, our, our code on a behavioral basis. Do we wear a seatbelt? How fast do we drive? How many steps a day do we walk? What do we eat? And all of those inputs can be processed to determine and predict our individual health, and that can be put into um, a algorithms that can help us make decisions. But that's going to cause us to confront this issue of uh, our own personal privacy and what we do because I, one of the things that, that we have learned relative to individual behavior change, we've seen this with our 
caregivers that when they have the information, not the data, there's more data than we know what to do with and there will be more in the future. When they're given the information, they will make decisions. Uh, we have to confront whether we're going to give the necessary information so that we can make the decisions and I think that's going to be a challenge for us. Yeah, I, thank you uh, for that. And this whole thing of technology keeps coming in, so I appreciate you commenting on that. Dave, you look like you wanted to say something. You asked uh, Dr. Dunnigan what the barriers may be to achieving behavior change or, or really finding what motivates people. And I think it's partially generational because we are just now entering a time when healthcare wasn't provided by your employer necessarily. For many of our parents and for some of us on this panel, part of the value equation of employment was coverage. They covered everything. I got into the business in 1989 with Blue Shield of Idaho. We had a plan that paid 90% of your hospital bill, 100% of your physician bill, and if you had a deductible, it was $100. That plan for a 35-year-old cost about 48 bucks a month. and that was paid by the employer. So there was, there was a barrier between the consumer and the actual cost of care. And having left that side of the industry, I'm, I'm an alum of almost 24 years in, on the insurance side, I can say these things. You don't get to. Um, we taught people to lie. If you wanted a checkup, you went to the doctor with a headache because we didn't pay for checkups for a long time, right? By the time we woke up to that, we said, well, if you want prescription drugs, here's this card, and if you take it in, it's only five bucks. The cost of the drug was 70. So we effectively separated people from the actual cost of care. It's not a blame issue. It, it is what it is. The consumers participated, the insurance companies created, the providers got paid. So there's enough blame to go around. But we effectively separated people from their role in the value equation. So now we're looking around saying, gosh, what motivates people to take care of themselves first with healthy behaviors? I think that's an opportunity, and it's also where one of the biggest barriers still lies. You know, and I, I appreciate those comments again, particularly we've talked about problematic systems, and that's a great example of it, um, and uh, how you set things up properly uh, to incentivize behavior. I, I'm going to switch directions a little bit here, um, and this question comes from uh, Dr. Jane Grassley, and uh, she is in our School of Nursing, and a conversation she had with a doctor of nursing practice. And as I throw this out, um, this is, is not meant to apply to all students, but it's, it's a general comment, and I'm curious on the, on the uh, panel's uh, thoughts on this. Given that many students have been somewhat sheltered from difficult life experiences, not all by any means, um, but maybe they didn't have a chance to go through the Great Depression, I guess was the best way we're trying to describe that. Um, and I think of my kids and the enrichment experiences that they have. Um, how do we educate this generation of students to be prepared to care for an aging population, advanced technology, moving from a fee-for-service, you can think of all the changes that are out there. What are some things that you think would be helpful as they come into the workforce that we might be able to focus on? Well, that's an interesting question. That you, maybe some of the sociologists can help us a, a, a little bit more. But I, frankly, I don't think my danger and my anxiety lies in the youth. Um, I guess they've seen the recession now, so they know what that's about a, a little bit. Um, and, and this ties to the to, to the previous discussion. I, my biggest concern is our culture uh, as being a real enemy to us and what the expectations of some of those seniors like I am have of the healthcare system, what their demands are, um, and uh, perhaps the inability in our country to think differently about our expectations of what it is we should be given, how much should be spent. Um, you know, we, we are a culture that says, I want it, and I want it today. Uh, I don't see that from the youth. I think they may be better prepared to help us than we think they are if we give them the tools and the skills. 
I worry about how it is that we educate our current folks who will be placing demands on the healthcare system to understand when it's appropriate and supportive of their recovery versus futile. Okay, so you kind of put that, flip that on its head. Uh, you have more concerned about uh, uh, maybe not the youth, but the other folks, and particularly how we change and grain patterns of behavior that we've become accustomed to. Interesting. Other thoughts, comments? Dick? Yeah, and let me, oh. a couple things. First, with the millennial generation, uh, uh, I see you as really, uh, and someone else had mentioned this earlier, being really the solution to this. You know, the boomers, uh, which I resemble, uh, kind of got us into this a bit. I think with some unrealistic expectations that medicine could provide everything for everybody at any moment. And that's just not the case. What I see with the millennials is much more of a team-based approach and a practical, realistic look at life. I train a lot of medical students and residents, uh, and I see that. Let me just play out a clinical example real quick. Uh, this is end of life. So we're all going to face that. Uh, we all have a lot of people that you know in your life that have faced this. So what you probably don't know is that 40% of an entire individual's lifetime expenses in healthcare comes in the last two years of their life. And about a quarter of that comes uh, in about the last six months. So if we had a more realistic expectation about talking with people earlier about how they wanted to face the end of life, there again lies a tremendous opportunity to really start to make some important choices. So let me just share with you quickly. Unless I get in an auto accident driving home from Boise State tonight, when my time starts to come, I want to be not in an ICU, with beepers and buzzers and bells and tubes in every body orifice I have, exposed to people I don't know. I want to be at home. I want to be dry. I want to be warm. I want to be as anxiety and pain free as I can, and that's where I want to die. Now, I would submit to you that we don't have those conversations in the depth that we must have them across this nation. We need to start to engage in better relationships amongst all of the healthcare team with people, again, working at the top of their licenses to truly understand what people want with their life. There is an example, again, of what we're talking about in terms if we start to develop the relationships, how we can start to make differences. You all, you all out there will be dealing with people like me when I'm dying. And I want you to re reflect on how we keep this patient-centered, on how we start to think about the person's choice as opposed to the system's choice, and we start to help dial that in for the individual and their family. Thank you. Again, uh, uh, it looks like you all are the, the answer out there. Uh, Dick, you wanted to say something? Yeah, uh, the, one of the things that uh, I've wanted to do and haven't been able to achieve it yet is to be able to use either internships or apprenticeships to a greater degree and this is specifically in the area of, of social work and those individuals that are going into uh, child protection or child welfare because one of the one of the things that you can't teach is um, what it's like to be uh, facing some of the horrific situations children find themselves in and for a lot of the current generation, especially those that have been protected from life experiences, they can't believe that it could ever happen. But it happens every day in Idaho, and it's unfortunate, but uh, we are the first line of defense for these children, and yet there needs to be some conditioning, because just going straight into it can be too much of a shock, and we lose a lot of people early on because they just simply cannot handle it. So one of my goals is to try to create some kind of an apprentice process so there's be more exposure early on and a good dose of reality and then some training specifically for that individual to understand and cope with the circumstance they're facing. Um, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll just springboard off that because uh, the opportunity and something students love are real life experiences. So the opportunity to do an apprenticeship or an internship one of the big challenges, I think, on both sides of higher ed and in, uh, within clinical settings and public health settings is 
how can we deal with the volume? We have 22,000 students. We have 4,300 that are in uh, the College of Health Sciences. And how do we provide the uh, clinical experiences, internships? How do we have the scalability uh, given the number of people that are going to be coming into the system with health care um, and across all these divisions? Um, thoughts on that? Not sure it's how can we it's how do we I mean I don't I, I, I guess if I'm being clear here I'm, I'm I'm saying that in the sense that uh, let's not think of it as a hurdle that is such a burden we can't get over and we're never going to change things it's it's suggesting how is it that we're going to adapt new technologies and new programs to effectively bring a message to people being educated on, on what it is that needs to be done I, it, it's not a matter of uh, suggesting we can do it any other way. That is the reality, and we're going to have to find ways to do it. I don't know that I have any perfect suggestions not being an educator or uh, being in that field, but it, it's just the reality. If I can, Tim, let me mm -hmm. build on that a little bit. I agree with Ed here. Um, uh, one word, simulation. Now, I recognize we all need approaches with real people. But I also find as an educator in healthcare that we're using more and more simulation to help train our residents so that they are well prepared when they actually do work with people. Technology is advancing to a point now with interactive artificial intelligence, getting close, very close to this point, where we can start to have interactions with software programs that can start to simulate real life experiences as well. Now I'm not saying that you just go to a simulation based model, but when we ask the question of then numbers and resources and technology, it's the application of simulation and ways to help prepare you better so that when you do start to then have the interactions, you're well prepared for that. And what I would also say is that all of you are students, you will all interact with living human beings all the time. There are things in those interactions, sometimes they're the smallest, simplest of things that you can use on a daily basis that will help you in applying that to all sorts of situations with other living human beings down, down, downstream. So there, first and foremost, there's stuff right now in front of you uh, in terms of your own human interactions that'll help. Number two is the advancement of technologies through simulation that I think can prepare, prepare you and help you too uh, that uh, will lead to better outcomes uh, with with the, their utilizations. Um, and I, I really appreciate both comments because I, I think that there's really a need, obviously, to get students into the settings. Um, but given the lift with that, simulation has been an area that um, we've really looked at, primarily in clinical areas. But we haven't used it as much in public health. Um, and I think uh, thinking of uh, uh, Director Armstrong's comments as we've just moved uh, uh, the School of Social Work, Kinesiology into the college, um, there's some opportunities to engage in those simulations as a way of learning. And I, I know that some students have been a little resistant to that. They would much rather be out in these clinical settings, but one of the realities is you can stand around a long time waiting for an event to happen. And if we have some structured scenarios in there, it least assures that you've had that experience as you've gone forward with that. So um, thanks for those comments. I, I want to, uh, I got a, a question here from the audience, and it, it ties into a number of questions that I received from students and faculty. Great ideas. So we've talked a bit uh, in Dr. Epperly's presentation about care coordination. That's something that we're going to look at starting up a certificate in next year. Uh, there was a lot of talk about teams and the need for teams and to work together in groups and to be patient-centric. Um, extensive uh, questions that I received about scope of practice, both positive and negative. Some concerns about uh, extending the scope of practice too far and problems with that, as well as uh, great solutions uh, that we can have. And the question here is, great ideas. Have you had any resistance to any of this? All of it, <laughs> in my experience. I mean, change is no different for caring, compassionate, 
people than it is for, for anybody else. Um, and introduce, that's, I guess, Tim, what I was trying to say earlier, but if you think reform has happened, I've got some real news. Um, things are going to be a lot different. Um, and how, I don't necessarily know, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to speak to different roles for people. It's going to speak for uh, different relationships among people who are working at a bedside. It's going to speak to a whole change in, I think, the way we have set expectations and the dynamics around that workforce. So change is no different. Change has to be dealt with and handled in other places maybe where the business community can get involved a little bit. Change management and some of those kinds of things and understanding what's going on. Change is like, you know, they're, it's like taxes. It, they're great as long as somebody else is involved with it, you know, but if it's me paying taxes or me uh, involved with change, then it's much more uh, personal. So uh, the dynamics are, are important, but it's going to be necessary if we're going to get where we need to go. Great comment about the change and getting back to the parallels with higher ed. We're going through the same changes too. So um, other comments on the change, Chris? Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, people talk about that, you know, I like change or I can deal with change, but if I asked you all to stand up and move one chair back, you'd, you know, groan and you'd hate the exercise and you kind of think about just changing seats and how painful that is. Uh, I agree with Ed. There, there's resistance to change and doing what we um, all know is the right thing to do on every level from every constituent, whether it's... Uh, Physicians, nurses, administrators, insurance companies, hospitals, clinics, you go to every area, the federal government, uh, people are motivated to want to do the right thing. We know what the right thing is. Uh, the economic engine of healthcare is a major governor in terms of our inability to uh, move forward and innovate and do things differently. Scope of care came up and they're legitimate issues around scope of care, uh, but we could also point to areas where it's just amazing that we uh, are not tapping into some of the potential we have because there's an association or there's a group or there's somebody trying to protect turf. And that's not to say it's that easy. There are legitimate issues, but every single place I turn, there is major resistance to change and I'm part of it. We're all part of it as well. And that's what we do every day. And my comment earlier about a positive attitude, there is no way to get through any of what we need to do without uh, saying, you know what, um, didn't work this time, we're gonna take another run at it, and another run at it, and another run at it, and we're gonna keep working at it, and we're gonna pull different people in. And if you don't have a positive attitude or some, uh, uh, some ability to look into the future and know we're gonna make, make it through it because we've got an exceptional team, then you may as you've already given up. Um, I, I appreciate those comments and particularly thinking about what we need to do in uh, training folks with their scope of work. Uh, historically, colleges are, are fairly isolated and siloed off. And um, as we look at that, um, I think the enhancement of a scope of practice also has to work into this team approach too um, as a critical piece with that. Dick? Well, Chris is right. It it depends on where you're coming from. Uh, there is re the resistance is coming from those who are getting the money and who aren't going to get the money in the future. Uh, <laughs> primary care, hey, they're happy. Uh, they're doing a great job. Uh, we just did a pilot, a two-year pilot, 55 clinics around Idaho, 3,700 uh, chronically ill patients. Uh, we paid uh, a bonus or a fixed fee to the primary care docs. And after that pilot, we saw a 26% reduction in in-hospital admissions and a 41% reduction in readmissions, 23% uh, reduction in emergency room. It was phenomenal. Now, again, 3,700 patients, 55 clinics. Well, the surgeons hadn't seen the effect of that yet. Some of these hospital administrators here are saying, wait, how much was that worth? Well, we invested $755,000 and I estimate the ROI uh, returned about 8.1 million. I'm sure the guy next to me would like to have part of that back. Uh, so as we go down the road, what we have to do is realize that as we make change, we have to reinvest some of those savings back in 
to the industry to allow them to change to a different business model because the business models will change and that just simply is a requirement of us payers as we go forward saying don't just take all the savings reinvest it for the better of tomorrow um, those are pretty stunning um, outcomes and uh, but I could see too even when you have a great idea there can be resistance that goes along with that um, so uh, one more comment here yeah. go ahead Tim thanks um, just a couple quick points on this um, the existing system is part of the problem there's no question about that and I will tell you that as a physician we're part of the problem uh, we must change. There's enough work for all of us to do, number one, in different ways. That's why this team has to happen. We all need to make less money so we can distribute that, that back into the system. Uh, we need to absolutely um, uh, think about when it comes down to these critical choices, not how we prop up physician incomes or hospital incomes. It needs to be and the North Star must be, what is the right thing to do for this person? If we start thinking like that as a system, we'll start making the right choices. Now, I know that's easy to say, but it is exactly the point. There will be enough people in power that will have their ox gored, as Chris alluded to. Their incomes will falter with this. They'll start to see revenue lines change that will start to fight this tooth and nail. As a physician, as a primary care physician, as a family physician, I will tell you that I must embrace, and I mean this with every fiber of my body, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, psychologists, social workers, community health workers, in different ways to project care. It can't be about me. It can't be about my income. It must be about how we collectively start to take care of people differently. So, yes, change is hard. We must downsize the income that's generated by this. We must broaden that workforce. We must have the workforce working in different ways for the better outcomes of the people we're here to serve. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to move on to one more question and then have some concluding remarks from the entire panel. Um, I received and continue to receive a number of questions in here uh, related to uh, uh, Medicaid expansion and redesign. Um, a, a lot of this has, has related to do we think this will possibly pass and if it doesn't what is the plan? And, and furthermore, what are the implications if it doesn't plan for students who go out into fields such as social work, nursing, and other areas? Any comments on this? We probably have about as knowledgeable of a group um, in the state. There's some other folks that could certainly be here that understand uh, Medicaid. And I knew I just threw out kind of a general thing with that. So you can kind of take this where you'd like to. Well, all of the public opinion surveys say that 60 to 70 percent of the citizens believe it should happen when 104 legislators get behind the closed doors of the state house uh, the opinion uh, shifts uh, i would say that the expansion just for the sake of expansion is a non-starter but we have proven through the study group that there is there are millions tens of millions of dollars available for other alter other uses uh, if we move uh, the expansion population uh, onto Medicaid. So there, there is a mathematical reason for doing it. Uh, you just have to find the alternative uses of that money, and then those uses overpower some of the resistance to expansion. Um, and I think one of the things that is floating now in the legislature is the need to expand funding for education and, you know, if it's a hundred million dollars, that's that's a lot of money to come up, uh, new money. But uh, you know, I've already volunteered. I know where 36 million of it is. If they just want to come knocking, um, so whether it does or it doesn't, the important part of what uh, Dr. Epperly outlined was reform is going to happen anyway. 
We are going to redesign Medicaid. We're going to reform health care delivery. The expansion population, which represents about 5% of the citizens of Idaho and the remaining 5% that don't have coverage today, will eventually happen. You know, whether it happens in this session or next, next session, it, it will happen because it's, it's the logical thing to do and it's the right thing to do. Uh, sometimes in Idaho, we just have to wait a while before we get around to the right thing. Uh, we'll try everything else first. Uh, so I think, it's, I think it'll happen. But for you, as you go out in the, in, in the industry, um, really you don't need to worry because it, it, it all the evolution is underway. Uh, the, the, uh, and I think that uh, your, your future is going to be very bright, very interesting too, because this is a, the, a, a major change. This transformation uh, has never seen bef uh, been seen before in this country. Thanks, Dick. Yeah, and uh, I think um, if you like to work in a dynamic area, it's certainly coming through, and this is one of them. Steve, you wanted to say something? Yeah, having spent the last three years of my career working on trying to get Medicaid expansion, I have quite a bit to say, but I won't say it all. Uh, it's, it's unlikely to be in the form that's really going to help. I, you know, I think where we're going that Ted showed with the uh, innovation grant in reforming our system is is important and that will probably get us there but the sad thing is that mathematics logic gets trumped by ideology in our current legislature uh, they just can't see it. the numbers are facing him we showed them the first year we tried expansion a hundred million dollars coming to the state in excess money could be would be excess over what almost 100 million or over what they would say by d eliminating a very expensive county medically indigent program i mean it was unbelievable the savings they could they could uh, have and the indigent program moves on the way it was it's a it's a horrible talk about sucking <laughs> I mean, it is the worst thing that was ever invented. You would never put together an insurance or any kind of a, a coverage program like that is. It's expensive to operate. It doesn't cover very many people. They spend $60,000 on 6,000 people. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. But ideology trumps all the, all the logic. Uh, and it's it's sad that those that money federal money that Idaho could have had is left on the table and we don't get it uh, at the expense of other states getting it and it's gonna Idaho's gonna be a loser. I'm sorry to get political about this, but that's uh, what it is. I, uh, I think you really bring up an important point and often you know you think about some of our clinical programs and how intensive they are for students and, and I you see them here at six in the morning at six at night and beyond. Um, but it really plays too and there were a number of questions how important public policy is in determining how health care is delivered and it impacts all of us even though as you're you're studying for your boards and things like that it may not pop into your mind but it, it's such a big driver in in what is done um, Dave you look like you wanted to say something before he does I yeah. just wanted to say uh, Steve was off by three zeros at 60 million for 6,000 people what did I say? 60,000. 60, 60 million, yeah. That's what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> Just a zero here or there. We're it's, good. Yeah, when yeah. you're retired, you kind of lose. <laughs> we had to deal with that when he ran the system. Too, so. <laughs> <laughs> Math is everywhere. No, I think Steve, Steve covered the ground pretty well. I, I would tell you that uh, if you're registered to vote in this state, to voice your opinion. Um, if you think it doesn't matter, you're wrong. And um, in full disclosure, I also served before taking uh, my role with St. Luke's on the Idaho uh, Health Insurance Exchange Board, and we worked very closely with a number of legislators around the concept of, of a new Medicaid program because you couldn't say reform over in the hallowed hall. So we called it redesign or something nonsensical like that. But um, the legislators were amazingly in tune 
with their constituents, and the loudest voices were getting through to a number of them. And yes, ideology does matter, but so do constituents. So if you're registered here, don't be silent. Thank you. Um, I want to finish up and just give everyone 30 seconds. And I want to turn this around a little bit. I want to see if you have any advice that you'd like to give to the faculty um, that are involved with the delivery of health care and the research um, that they engage in. Um, any last thoughts that you'd like to share? And again, we'll keep it to one. Uh, I guess my thought would be uh, look at both research and could be practice. I think there's a different caregiver out there that we haven't invented yet. I think there, there's everybody's in their silo now. I think there needs to be some kind of a generalist. I have no idea what you'd call it. But I think that is something that really ought to be researched, looked at, and uh, you know, I can remember it's one of the, you know, the, Tim's question about uh, good, uh, uh, good ideas. I had a good idea once. <laughs> and <laughs> that idea was uh, during the, the uh, nursing shortage a few years back. And we were discussing why can't we get more males into the nursing profession? I said, well, quit calling it nursing. And I got about got lynched. But, and they still, they still call it nursing, and I, but there are males coming into nursing now. I think it's, it's, uh, it's a, a little bit different. But I think there's another caregiver out there that needs to be invented. Thanks, Steve. Ed? And the only thing I might say is, uh, as much as we've talked about collaboration, teamwork, coordination, all those kinds of things amongst you folks, I would suggest to the faculty that they would think about it in the same vein as well amongst themselves as faculty members, understanding and appreciating how dynamic things are out there, how fast they're changing. Um, try to, um, as much as you can, appreciate what it is that the healthcare organizations are trying to do to change. Adapt that, if you will, in your, um, in your programs and work with each other in a teamwork kind of fashion. I'm not suggesting you don't. I'm just suggesting it probably has to be more intense than it's been before, but find ways to, uh, to bring that flavor and uh, message to the students uh, and the campus as well. Thank you. Marty? I think I'd just like to say that the uh, largest untapped resource in healthcare today is the consumer. If we can do a good job at educating consumers about good healthcare, how to be critical about their education, how to learn about healthcare, um, how to be critical about the evidence they're presented. Uh, it'll take us a long way down the road. Consumer, lay people, healthcare workers are, are going to be necessary, and well educated ones are the way to provide the workforce that we haven't got now. And supplying them with good health education that's based on the evidence is um, one way to get there. Thank you. Dave. Well, if you keep using excellent adjunct professors like Corey, <laughs> I think you'll get the message across. Because bringing professionals in from uh, you know, actively engaged in the community into the classroom, I think, helps uh, immensely. Great. Dave? Stay nimble in your thinking. Multidisciplinary professionals are going to matter in the future. Chris? If we had substituted the word education for healthcare, or whatever lingo we used, you could apply about every principle we've talked about to education, and we've talked about reform of the education system as well as the healthcare system. So I often think of the faculty very much like the medical staff or the physician in, in healthcare. So it's going to require that same level of uh, uh, insight, willingness to change, collaboration, and willing to uh, fail fast and learn from a faculty perspective. Thank you. Ted? Yeah. Uh, the one piece that I would say to you all, uh, both faculty and students, it's going to take some time to get this right. Um, it's taken 100 years, really, to kind of get our system like it is. It's going to take at least a good 20, maybe 25, to really untangle all of this. So you, you all are going to be working for those that choose to go into healthcare through the midst of tremendous change here. So 
echo the points on change management, on change fatigue, but also on patience in regards to letting a lot of this <coughs> start to play out. So I, I just want to end my, my, this last comment with a, a quote from Winston Churchill, uh, one of my favorites. Um, and in the dark days of World War II, uh, London, Great Britain was just getting bombed, as, as you all know. And he said a very short thing to the people of England, and it was never, never, never give up. And I don't think we should ever give up on trying to change this healthcare system to get it along the lines we've talked about today. That is our goal. That's what we need to continue to push for. So as you all go through this and as your, your faculty teach you, don't lose track of why we're trying to do this and what we're trying to achieve with it. It's gonna take some time. Well, I, um, I can't thank the panel enough. Uh, I think we've had a, a real insight into a variety of areas and um, I really appreciate you all taking times out of your busy schedule to share with uh, faculty and students here. And would you all please give them a round of applause. Um, I, I also want to mention uh, they're available for, what, four or five hours to visit with people <laughs> afterwards. But uh, they would be more than happy to visit uh, to answer some questions. And again, um, they'd love to get a, a chance to meet some of the students and faculty and uh, have an opportunity to talk a little bit. So we'll kind of mingle around down here for a few minutes and feel free to come up and uh, talk. Thank you.